Hello and welcome to our webinar, Leveraging MBSE to Improve the Patient Experience. My name is Michael Gans, Senior Program Manager for Life Sciences at Dassault System, and I'll be moderating this session. This is the first webinar in our five-part series, Model-Based Systems Engineering for Medical Device Applications, in which we cover numerous topics we hope will advance your MBSE practices. Now, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Casey Medina. Casey currently practices and teaches systems and quality engineering across industries, including the medical device, aerospace, and defense industries. He is a dynamic speaker and owns Studio SE, a systems engineering training and consulting firm located in the Denver area. He has extensive experience deploying and training model-based systems engineering, requirements engineering, model-based systems engineering, uh, human factors, quality engineering, risk management, and medical device design control. Casey has adapted systems engineering tools and techniques to analyze social and natural systems. Casey is working to identify, analyze, and address social issues that lead to homelessness to help organize, provide, targeted, customized, and aid to help individuals overcome the challenges that lead to experiencing homelessness. Casey has developed products in the areas of automated stem cell growth, patient monitoring, pulse oximetry, blood collections, electrosurgery, and therapeutics. He holds 12 patents for medical devices and another six patent applications awaiting approval. Prior to designing medical devices, he led creative development for Team Z Incorporated, which produced architectural and interior design products. Casey infuses practical experience into his training programs. He has multiple publications and has been invited as a guest lecturer at the University of Denver, Dublin City University, and the University of Colorado. Additionally, he has presented numerous trade and professional organizations due to his pragmatic approach to design. Casey also serves as, as the lead instructor for the Caltech MBSC certification program. And now without any further ado, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Casey. Casey, it's all yours. Good morning, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm really, really excited to be here with you. This is one of my absolute favorite topics and I think at the end of this, at the very least, if you're not familiar with it, you'll be intrigued. If you are familiar with it, hopefully it will bring in an additional bit of motivation to help everybody move forward in these more advanced methodologies and practices. So I'd love to hear uh, <clears throat> who is on the line. So if you wouldn't mind in the chat window, just maybe give a shout out to your organization and, and maybe your, your state or your city. I'd love to know who's out there with us today. I'd like to talk to you today about model-based systems engineering in the context of food. So it turns out I love food. I'm kind of a foodie, actually, and, and I think that anytime we get to mix engineering and food, it's a good day. So we're going to talk about model-based systems engineering in the context of a well-balanced diet. So that asks the question, what is a well-balanced development effort? Well, if we go to our history, Every one of us, I'm sure, learned the food pyramid. Right? This was the ideal balance of nutrition to ensure that we had what we need in our diet to be successful. Now, food pyramid is definitely older than I am. And so more recently, the federal government, a different graphic. So they show, again, the composition of things that you need in your diet to ensure that you have the nutrition you need to be successful. But for today's talk, I'd like to move back to the food pyramid. Because for those of you that are familiar with systems engineering and, and with development practices, you'll recognize that if we turn the food pyramid upside down, it looks a whole lot like the system V model. Now, the system V model is the standard model that we use in the international systems engineering community. And it's actually a very valid model for a number of reasons. One, it's representative of how we as humans think about the world. It's how we process information and how we develop solutions to problems. Two, it helps us understand that everything we're doing in a development effort adds value. So let's take a look at this particular view of the model. This is a model or a view of the model I published in 2015. And 
What's special about this is I've replaced all of the, the typical process steps with a set of questions. Because it turns out asking great questions and understanding the types of information we need to know at any point in the process helps us to be successful. So we start at the top left of the V, we progress down to the bottom and we come back up the right side. At the top left, we start with the question, what do my stakeholders need? Now, in a lot of development processes, this will be stated as get stakeholder needs, do stakeholder research. Okay? But we're gonna swap these a little bit and ask them in the form of questions because it engages our team. So what do my stakeholders need? Once I've answered that question, I can then ask, how can I be sure I build what my stakeholders need? So this is a very important translation step that's often overlooked, where we translate the needs we collect from our stakeholders into a set of needs that are relevant in the context of the system we're hoping to build. From here, we move into what functions does the system need to perform? What are its essential characteristics? Simply put, what does it need to do? Then we can ask, what's the system structure? What does each piece do in the system to help achieve the mission? This is the whole nature of system architecting. Everything we do here is helping us develop a plan and a roadmap for the detailed design effort that we will eventually engage. Then we can ask how the product requirements translate to each component. This is a decomposition of requirements. What's the plan for making sure the system's components all fit and work together? This is the all important step of integration. Integration is one of those steps that's most often missed by companies across the board because we really don't take the time to understand the nature of integration and understand what it's trying to help us accomplish. And so when we put this in the form of a question, now all of a sudden we understand why we're doing it and why it's important. Next is how will each domain contribute to the system's success? So now we're talking about mechanical requirement specifications, electrical requirement specifications, software, so on and so forth. And finally, when we get to the bottom, we ask the question, what is the solution? This is the detailed design effort. Now, this is where engineers are happy. This is the happy place, right? I don't know how many folks on the line in their college careers ever took a class called problem definition. I didn't. I took a ton of classes in engineering school that all had to do with problem solving, but none of them had to do with problem defining. So the challenge we have with our teams is that we have to make sure we have defined the problem well enough that the engineers and, and scientists and other folks working to solve the problem are solving the right problem and that they're solving it in a way that's value added for our stakeholders and our customers. So as we start at the top left and come down to the bottom, this is all defining the problem. This work helps us to understand the space in which we need to operate so that we can then innovate inside that space. This helps focus our innovations. It helps target the market, the customer segment, and the product lines that will bring the most value to us and to our stakeholders. So down this vertical axis, we're increasing our depth of understanding. And as we come up the right side of this V, we're starting to ask different questions. Did I satisfy my domain requirements? Well, that's low level verification. Do those pieces fit together? This is an integration step. So we're gonna put the things together. Do they fit? and work together. Then, did I satisfy my subsystem requirements? Another verification step. Do those subsystems fit and work together? And finally, when we've proven that, now does my system satisfy its system level requirements? When I move above this dashed line that we'll discuss in a moment, we can then ask, did I satisfy the user needs? And finally, how does the market respond to my design? So what we're doing is breaking our development effort up into a set of questions that helps us put our activities in context and helps us understand the information we need to learn so that we can be successful in our development effort. Now, the dashed line represents the difference between verification 
and validation. Below the line, we're verifying. So we're answering the question, did I build the thing right? Did I build the thing right according to my requirements and specifications? That's a very, very different question than we ask in validation. Validation asks the question, did I build the right thing? Did I build the right thing for my customers, the mission, and the environments of use? Does this add value? Is it usable? Does it fit into the environment? So as we work through our development processes, and whether we're defining processes or we're refining them, maybe we're starting over, we come into a change management process, it's important to know where we are in the context of the overall system development cycle so that we know the information we need and we can efficiently get there. So once we've talked about our development process, the next question is, what's a medical device? So let's take a look at the model-based systems engineering description of medical device, or a model-based systems engineering description. So in the middle, we have a medical system. That medical system contains documentation, I think owner's manuals, instructions for use, things like that. It has the device itself, and it has any accessories that are necessary to use that device. Now, for the purposes of our medical device development lifecycle, this medical system may be representative of a prototype medical system or a finished medical system. Right? Because we know that we can perform verification and validation in some cases on prototype systems. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge that and that we handle it smartly moving forward so that we get the most leverage out of that work as, as we can. Now, there are a number of medical systems that exist, right? These are a few of the systems that I've developed using these methodologies, or at least contributed to the development of these systems using these methodologies. This is the quantum cell expansion system. I started on this project July 25th, 2005, using model-based systems engineering and accompanying methodologies. By Thanksgiving of that same year, we were actually growing cells in a prototype system. These methods definitely work and they work well. This is a pulse oximetry system. Pretty straightforward, it's kind of standard of care now. We have a blood collection and therapeutic device. And then we have some electrosurgical and other surgical, minimally invasive surgical tools. So all of these systems benefit from the value that we can bring using model-based systems engineering. So when we look at the process of designing a medical device, that process has several components. We have to have a plan. Right? We have to have design input. In systems engineering, that's requirements, right? In FDA terminology, they call it design input. We have to have design reviews periodically. We have to have detailed design. We have to have verifications and validations, and this big plan to transfer our design from development into production. Each one of these processes can be enabled and to be made more efficient and more robust with model-based systems engineering. So let's take a quick look at the FDA's view of design. They like something called the waterfall model. So we start at the top with our user needs and then we move into design input and, and we're shown that there's a review cycle after each one of these, right? Or at least there should be. And then once we get to design output, ooh, there's this big verification step. And once we've finished, we have our finished medical device, there's this huge validation step. Well, there's actually a problem with this in that this model doesn't recognize that certain things like verification and validation are in fact life cycle processes. So what happens is we see medical device companies time and again 
treat verification as the thing you do second to last and validation is the thing you do last. That causes huge problems for us, right? Because if we find the problem after we've designed and we say, yes, this design is good, I'm gonna go verify. Well, we now have to go all the way back through the cycle to understand where we went wrong. Likewise with validation, it's even worse if we're doing this work in the clinic. So we want to take the waterfall model and say good information, but we want to start to transition to a more holistic view of our development cycle. And that's what we get when we look at the V model. Notice the V model takes all of this into consideration, but it recognizes that this information builds on itself and it recognizes that verification and validation happen throughout the project, not simply when we think we're finally done with the design. There's another problem that we encounter in medical devices. And it's summarized by this little cartoon. Think this is bad? You should see the inside of my head. We have a problem with tribal knowledge. Rather, we don't have a problem with tribal knowledge. We have a problem using tribal knowledge. Right? We have a lot of, of very experienced team members. They know a lot of information about our systems, about the design, about the history. And that's great. But what I find is they're often reluctant to share that, especially reluctant to write it down. Because the perception is as soon as I do that, I'm not as valuable and I'm on my way to being obsolete. I've been doing this for 35 years. If I share this information that makes me valuable, I become obsolete. Well, what if there were tools that made sure that didn't happen? What if there were tools that freed up this brain space so that we didn't spend all that time trying to remember our history? We spent that time using the experience to push forward. That's where we're trying to go. We want to be able to take this collective experience, put it together in a common place, and use these definitions to help us expand our technology, to make deeper connections, and to push innovation and technology development forward in new and exciting ways. There's also a fear of the unknown when we look at adopting anything new, right? It's dark in my current room, and I know if I step through that door, there's light there. But what happens on the other side? It's unknown. And the unknown can be scary to our teams. So we have to find ways to guide them into this unknown space. And then, of course, I'm busy, right? Everybody's busy, especially now. You think that everybody working from home, maybe you'd have a chance to, to get caught up on some things. When in fact, I find that, that people are busier now than they've ever been in some cases. So we've got a lot of challenges. How can we solve them? Well, let's use MBSE, right? Brilliant idea. But what does that mean? What is model-based systems engineering in the first place? Firstly, you can't let MB without the S of this. So we have to first understand the core concepts in systems engineering. Then we can introduce the model-based methodologies. So simply put, model-based systems engineering is very similar to using CAD, SOLIDWORKS, for example, to design a mechanical part. It's very similar to using a, a simulation environment to understand the forces and stresses, uh, using a piece bias environment to help design a circuit board and analyze its, its performance. So MBSE is taking those types of methodologies and technologies and applying them to the entire system so that we have a collective set of information that's useful, not just in the moment in the design, but also moving forward as we manage change, obsolescence, and we plan new versions of our products. So the real value 
is that MBSE shifts our focus from documentation to design. In traditional development environments, especially medical device, we have a lot of standards, we have a lot of regulations, there's a lot of rules, right? We have a ton of rules that we have to follow. And invariably, our proof that we follow these rules lies in documentation. We have to have a plan. So we have a plan template in our, our development process, right? Then we have to have our user needs and design inputs, our requirements. So we have requirements templates. Then we have templates for our design work. We have templates for our test. We have templates for human factors. We have templates for design transfer. And so our focus is mostly on filling out these documents. But when we introduce MBSE, we can shift our focus and skew our focus more towards the actual development of the design because our MBSE tool can produce documentation for us. No, it can't produce all the documentation, but it can produce a bunch of documentation. Our requirements traceability tables can be auto-generated. Our interface control documents can be auto-generated. We can model our test cases. We can capture all of our stakeholder research, our voice of customer work. All of that can be captured in the model, and we can generate documents from them. So, the value here is that we're giving our, our development teams the freedom and the flexibility to think about the design itself. And while we're thinking about the design, we're going to get efficiencies in creating the documentation. Now, the cool thing about this, this also works for legacy or existing systems. So we've all got products in our portfolios that have been around forever. If we take a little bit of time, every time we've got an obsolescence or a change, to add to our understanding by modeling this change before long, we have a pretty complete model of the system. And we've now captured all of our legacy models, all of this legacy information in a model that we can use moving forward. So this isn't an all or nothing approach. This is a methodology and a set of tools that helps us gain insights, efficiencies, and enhance our effectiveness in our development efforts. Now, the big buzzword, anytime you hear that you go to a systems engineering conference or a webinar or whatever, it's always the same. MBSE creates a single source of truth. Now, I'm gonna nitpick this just a tiny little bit. I don't like the use of the word truth here. And that's because truth is a function of our past experience, our perception, and our biases. Okay, we see that. I know my truth. I know my truth. You know your truths. They're likely different. So what is to say it's not different on a project? And the reason I'm nitpicking this is because we want to be able to ensure that our models are not interpretable multiple ways. Right? Everybody needs to be working from the same information. So some of you might remember this guy, right? Lieutenant Joe Friday. What was his big quote? Just the facts, ma'am. Not what's to tell the truth, just the facts. So we want to change this and flip it a little bit so that MBSC and our models are creating a single source of fact so that we can have the confidence that we're all going to have the same set of information, that information can be proven and that we're making good, consistent decisions using that information. So what's a model? We've said that word a lot, right? We've said model-based systems engineering a bunch, but what is a model? And absolutely the best definition I've ever found for model comes from Merriam-Webster. It's a pattern of something to be made. So if we break this down a little bit, a pattern. So some of you sew, or at least you're familiar with, with the art, the craft. In sewing, a pattern tells you how much material you need. It tells you the shape of things. It shows you where the selvage is. It shows you where you have to stitch, where you have to cut, in some cases where you have to pin, the orientation of the fabric. Okay. So it's a plan of sorts, a set of instructions. 
of something to be made. So something is tangible, right? Could be a process, it could be a product, but it's a tangible thing to be made. We're going to realize this in the real world. We're going to build this thing. So we've got a set of instructions for this thing that we're going to build. That's what we get out of our modeling work, a pattern of something to be made. And when we keep that in mind, it helps us understand that there's a purpose to this and that above all, there's value to this, value to our teams, value to our company, and ultimately value to our stakeholders. So when we think about the purpose of the model and what a model is, it helps us realize that there should be inherent value in it. And if not, we need to go back and rethink our processes and our use of the methodologies so that there is value. So what's in it for me? It's a popular question and it's definitely relevant. Right? Many, many medical device companies don't really understand MBSE, and that's okay. Industries evolve at different paces. Even the most, the industries that are most advanced at using these methods still have wide variation in its application. So we always have to ask this question and answer it genuinely. What's in it for me? We have a description of our system that's cohesive and coherent. And this cohesive, coherent description can actually be used to ensure that our development efforts staying on track, that our plans are being followed, and that what we ultimately develop and deliver to the customer is what we said we would. Because it provides a roadmap for our development effort. We've identified all the pieces of our system, what those pieces need to do, how well they need to do it, their critical characteristics, their interfaces with other pieces, how they interact. So we now have a roadmap for the development effort and especially our verification and validation work for risk management, for human factors analysis. All of this work is enabled by a solid understanding of our system through the use of models. When we have this roadmap, and we're populating our model, we're getting a traceability schema implemented. We're gonna be able to start with use cases that capture our voice of customer research. We're gonna trace those use cases into activities, into pieces of system structure and behaviors, into test cases, and we'll get a full report of that so that we can show absolutely that every piece of our system has full traceability up and down the development chain. helps us work through change management. So let's say we've got a particular component of our system that's going obsolete. Maybe we've got a little circuit board that's going obsolete and we have to replace this. Well, every engineer on the planet's gonna ask whether they acknowledge it or not, what's it need to do? And how well does it need to do it? We've already captured that information in the model. We have requirements for it. So we can now, cut out a large part of this process where we used to have to go through and try to revamp, reanalyze, re-understand what somebody else did so that we could find the replacement part. Well, now all that information exists. So we're making our change management much more efficient. We're also able to use these components that we've modeled in future development efforts. So we wanna make sure that if I've designed the circuit card once, I've got requirements, I've got the interfaces for it, I've got its description, I don't want to have to do that again. Next year, we're developing a follow-on system. It's going to use that same part. I'm going to go to my library, pop it in the model, and all of that work is already done, including traceability to test cases. So. I'm getting a lot of efficiencies through this modular approach to development. And of course, we get automated document generation. That's powerful in and of itself. 
So there are a number of diagrams that are available to us in, in SysML. Okay, so we've talked about MBFC. MBFC is a set of tools and methodologies. We're going to shift our focus for a second and talk about SysML. Okay, SysML stands for System Modeling Language. And SysML is, for those of you that may be familiar with software development, is a subset of UML2 with extensions. So years ago, the international systems community looked at this really cool software development tool set and said, you know what? We want that for systems as well. So they adopted pieces of UML and extended it to allow us to describe entire systems. And the resulting tool and language has nine diagrams in it. We have package diagrams. We have use case diagrams. We have activity diagrams, requirements diagrams, block definition diagrams, state machine diagrams, internal block diagrams, sequence diagrams, and parametric diagrams. Okay. So nine different types of diagrams that help us characterize one or more aspects and attributes of the system we hope to achieve. Now, looking at this, especially for the first time, we're thinking, wow, my appetite's not that big. Maybe your organization is still paper-based. Maybe you have a small development team with tight timelines. And the thought of implementing all of this is a bit daunting. That's okay, because we can cut some calories out of this. Right? We don't have to use all nine diagrams every time. We use the diagrams that are useful to help us characterize the problem. So these are my go-to diagrams. I always use use case diagrams. Right? We do voice of customer work. We capture information about how our users want to interact with our system. We put that information in use case diagrams. I use activity diagrams. Activity diagrams help us answer the question, what does the system need to do? We have to know the answer to that question. So we can use activity diagrams to do that. Requirements diagrams. This is how we achieve traceability. Now, many organizations with whom I've worked have implemented this method purely for the sake of tracking and tracing their requirements because there's so many efficiencies we get simply by using requirements diagrams. And that's often how these methodologies are introduced to companies as a way to help track and trace requirements in a more automated fashion. We use block definition diagrams. Block definition diagrams essentially give us a visual bill of materials. It tells us all of the parts and pieces that comprise our system. We might use a state machine. All systems exhibit some form of state-based behavior. In fact, it's very natural for us as humans to think about states. The question, hey, what are you doing? It's actually asking, in what state are you operating? Anytime we use ING, I'm driving to work, I'm delivering a webinar, I'm washing dishes. You're describing your state. The gerund form of the verb describes our state. And then we can use the tasks that exist in each one of those states. While you're washing dishes, at any point in that state, you may rinse the dish, you may scrub the dish, you may rinse the soap off of it, dry the dish, place it in the cabinet. So states are collections of like activities. So they're intensely useful in just helping us to describe our systems concisely and correctly. Because almost every system in existence, natural or man-made, exhibits some form of state-based behavior. And then I'll use an internal block diagram. An internal block diagram tells me how all of the parts of our system are connected to each other and how that system connects to the environment around it. Other systems that it has to talk to, in some cases we can talk about how it connects to a user. 
So this gives me my interface definitions. So using a subset of these diagrams, I get a ton of information that's inherently useful. And I want to make sure that as we move forward, anytime we implement these methodologies, <clears throat> we don't try to go so all in on this that we intimidate our teams, that we get lost in the complexities of the syntax, and that we forget about what we're doing. So it's important to, again, know where we need to go and have an understanding of how we're going to get there so that we can pick the best tool for the job. And in doing that, we have to have a solid understanding of our development process. So we start with an idea. We then tell the story of that idea. That story has three major components, value proposition, stakeholder analysis, and a description of the use model. So we tell our story, we analyze it. Is the story compelling? If it is, we move forward into a formal stakeholder analysis. From our stakeholder analysis, we can develop use cases, and we can map our stakeholders to the use cases that they impact or are impacted by. From there, we have this really great mapping that is the foundation for helping us understand our set of user needs. So anytime I have a, a stakeholder mapped to a use case, I have at least one need. And in this next step, I characterize those needs, I understand them to help me develop a mission statement for my system. And from there, we move into a, a step where I'm defining the system scope and boundary. And this is a critical translation. Up until now, I've been existing in the stakeholder context. My job now is to transition to the system context. And I'm going to use three foundational systems engineering tools to do that. Context diagram, functional flow block diagram, and IDEF0. Now, all of these concepts are concepts that I teach in my MBSE class. Again, because I feel that without a process, all the modeling in the world isn't going to help. So once I have my system scope and boundary defined, I can then move forward and define my requirements and decompose my architecture, meaning work toward designing my system. Okay? So once I have this process in place, now I get the full benefit of the tools. Because like Chris Farley tells us, if you don't work the steps, you'll be living in a van down by the river. And nobody wants that to themselves, their team, or their project. So it's important to keep in mind where we're headed at every point in time. So let's talk about these a little bit. We've got our use case diagram. Well, I'm going to use this to perform stakeholder analysis. I can identify functionality that, or services that my users need. I can understand potential user interactions with my system, and I can identify threats. All of our systems experience threats. Those threats could be misuse or use error. Right? They're different. It could be a cyber threat. It could be some sort of malicious intent. Here we have the ability to analyze all of those and identify the threats as they relate to operational performance. From here, I mentioned we move into our system scope and boundary. So we're going to use some tools that I'm going to go over kind of quickly right now to help us understand that. So I have our context diagram. Our context diagram analyzes the mission state. It tells us what inputs we have to our system and what outputs our system will produce. It tells us what considerations will impact our ability to be successful. And it will tell us what types of key enabling technologies will encourage us to be successful. From here, we describe step-by-step -step process for how our system's going to operate. And then, we can show how all of the inputs move through these functions, these tasks, to become outputs. So we've characterized the behavioral model for our system. This is the basis for risk management. This is the basis for human factors. It's the basis for verification and validation. 
Once we have this description, we can take all of this information and port it into a model where we can actually simulate it, we can analyze it, and we can evaluate it for changes and impacts. So we use an activity diagram to do this. It's generated from these foundational models. It helps us understand the use model, and more specifically, it helps us understand what the system needs to do to be effective for our users. Again, it's a roadmap for VNV, it's a roadmap for risk analysis, and it is the basis for change management. Once we have our set of activities, we actually are about to get our requirements almost for free because our requirements are based on the functionality we've defined for our system. So we can use a requirements diagram to capture that information. So here we see that we have a requirement for a glucose monitoring system, right? The GMS shall obtain glucose concentration from a patient sample. And I'm gonna verify that with a demonstration or by demonstration. This requirement is satisfied by a part of our system called the glucose measurement acquisition element. And it has some parts and it has some constraints on it. And we're gonna verify this requirement with a test case called test protocol steps. So in one picture, I'm creating traceability to and from my requirements. We can then talk about any state-based behavior we might have. So let's say we've got a complex device. And we have a complex set of tasks and interactions. Well, we can look at like tasks and interactions, group them and describe them using state machines. It helps us get a big picture of the operational environment of our system. What is it going to do? Now we can talk about the structure. What are the pieces and parts that build the structure of our system? And so we here we have our glucose monitoring system. Here's the, the glucose acquisition element. There's a sensing subsystem, there's a user interface component, there's external communication, and there's processing. We also have a packaging element. There's transportation monitoring, and there's shipping and packaging subsystem. So we see all the pieces that go into our system in one picture, and we're seeing their attributes, their behaviors, and other key information that's going to help us keep our development on track and ensure that it stays on track moving forward. We can then talk about how these pieces are connected. So in a big development effort, you might have multiple teams or, or a big team with a lot of different folks, each working on a different piece of the development. Well, we wanna make sure that all of the work they're doing fits in and connects appropriately. So we use an internal block diagram to show those interfaces. We wanna make sure that we know what's going where in our system and that we have the ability to ensure our teams are going to be successful in satisfying and implementing those interfaces. Okay. So there are a few tips and tricks that I like to share with all of my teams when we implement MBSE. One, we want to put all of this work in a common vernacular. All organizations have a unique culture. Often they've evolved their own set of terms. Don't change it. We're going to use our organization's terminology to help them understand this process. Don't look at MBSE as this big cure-all silver bullet that will satisfy and, and solve all of the organization's problems. Look at this as an enabler for successful, essential, effective processes. We get time savings, we get efficiencies, we get really in-depth information and knowledge. We want to make sure that we're using that to its fullest extent. And to do that, we have to build this implementation around a robust process. And of course, make sure your team understands and knows why you're creating the models in the first place. There has to be value. There has to be information that we're gaining that's useful in helping us deliver a solid, robust project system.
all of this is in service of spending more time on development and less time stressing about documentation. And we find that when that happens, teams have more fun and we realize that modeling should be fun. This should be viewed as, as something that's helping us get there better, faster, more efficiently, that's helping us deliver impact to our projects, that gives us influence over our markets. It's really fun and it can be done very, very quickly. It does not have to be a long, tedious, cumbersome event. So thank you for your time today. I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Casey. That's an excellent presentation and a great way to kick off this webinar series. Um, as Casey mentioned, we'll move into the Q&A session for today. And it does look like we've had a few questions come in already, so let's jump into it. So Casey, great. how easily does MBSC integrate into the development process? It seems like a lot of work that we haven't done before. MBSC integrates because it's essentially augmenting things that you're already doing. MBSC is a way to ensure that we're focused on the correct considerations. And it's a way of formally acknowledging the work that we're already doing. There's a lot of work that happens that exists kind of in our heads. And MBSC is a way of taking that information, formalizing it in a way that we can use it moving forward. Perfect. Um, I believe this question is referring back to the upside down food pyramid slide you were showing. Um, but you had on the left side was referring to stakeholders, while on the right side you were referring to users. Um, can you explain how you would bridge those two sides? Uh, let's see, on the left side, referring to stakeholders, sure. Um, and I, I could probably change that terminology. Um, I was, so stakeholders and, and users, users are a subset of stakeholders. And specifically, the term was user needs. And so that was um, bringing in a, a bit of FDA terminology there. So um, I apologize for the confusion, but we would be looking across the board at all of the stakeholder considerations, as well as the formal validation of the user needs per the FDA guidance. Great question. I hope that answers your question. Please let me know uh, uh, if there's more to it. I'd be happy Definitely. to continue talking. Perfect. Um, would you say, is there a learning curve? It seems like it would take people a long time to kind of come up to speed in the use of MBSE. So the, the learning curve is actually pretty short in that if we focus on a few key considerations, anybody can learn to use this methodology quickly. In fact, my formal full class is a 48 hour class. Um, I've taught subsets of this in a few hours uh, to a couple days and then the, the full course is is a full six days so the learning curve is really short and the way i teach this methodology is kind of the way i would want to learn it meaning we learn a concept we practice it together and we make sure that those concepts are relevant immediately relevant to the work that you're doing on the job Perfect. Um, how applicable is this for smaller organizations? It seems like there's definitely value in using this on large projects and large organizations, but does it translate to smaller teams and projects? It absolutely does. The cool thing about systems engineering and model-based systems engineering and all of these methodologies is that if it's a big system, it's a big effort. It's a small system, it's a small effort. The process to get there is exactly the same. So any tools we use to develop a big system are exactly the same tools we'll use to develop a small system. And that means the same methods, the same processes are applicable across the board. So the difference is the amount of effort it takes to characterize the system is much larger for a large system. Perfect. Um, in your experience, ranging over multiple industries, what would you say the rough percentage of adaption of MBSE is in medical device engineering as opposed to the more typical SE solutions like automotive, aerospace, and defense? So we're at a very exciting time in the medical device community right now. 
um, we're starting to see more connectivity than ever. And what we're finding is that adoption of MBSE and med devices is really in its infancy. So I don't really have a percentage per se. Uh, there are some folks in the International Council on Systems Engineering that, that are studying that a bit. Um, there's a, a group at Siemens uh, that is, is actually uh, studying maturity and, and capabilities across industries. And, and what they've they found is it, it kind of varies uh, organization to organization. Personally, what I've seen is that we're definitely in our infancy in med devices with respect to adopting these methodologies. But the sooner we do it, the sooner we bring these on board, the easier it's going to be for us to handle the major technological challenges heading our way. We're starting to consider IoT, Internet of Things. We've got devices that historically haven't ever had any kind of connectivity are now connecting to hospital networks. Doctors are wanting to, to be able to get patient data on their phones. So we have a lot of major interface technology challenges headed our way that these methods are well suited to help us handle. So to answer your question bluntly, work it's come it's up and coming it's it's pretty low adoption right now but there are pockets of work being done across companies that is bringing light to the methodologies and helping to demonstrate its power and its its impact excellent the next question what are the top three pain points you'd say of transitioning to mbsc for the design engineers and for management I would say uh, culture is the biggest one. Um, the second one is legacy. By that I mean, well, we've had products on the market for 20 years. We've never done this before. Why would we need to now? So there's a lot of, of salesmanship that has to happen to demonstrate the power and the value of this as we move forward. And it's it's often has to we have to bring the organization with us we have to invite them to this methodology it's not a matter of us forcing it on the organization they have to come willingly and that means we have to present the value proposition clearly and effectively and the third piece quite honestly is the investment in the infrastructure um, i'm not paid by Dassault or no magic or, or anybody associated with this i'm I'm doing this because I believe in the methodology and I do happen to use these tools in my private practice and in my instruction. But the investment can be a bit intimidating to organizations. So I find those three are, are kind of the, the biggest challenges, culture, legacy, and the upfront investment. The perception is because tools, purchases can be viewed as capital equipment expenditures or um, just a, a big upfront expense. Nobody wants to absorb that expense into the project. And so finding a place to uh, kind of allocate that budget can be tricky. And I find that's once you've brought the culture along, once you, you've kind of evolved this notion of legacy, that's really the big hurdle is, is how do I pay for it? Understood, that makes sense. Um, the next question, would you say that MBSE is always the right way to go if you if the know-how is already on site? Or do you believe that some projects might not be worth the effort to develop the models? And if so, is there a certain size of project, um, whether it's talking about complexity, cost, or risk, at which MBSE becomes, quote unquote, worth it? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, for me, because MBSE is implemented in the context of a, of a development process, I follow the exact same process every time I develop a system. Whether that system is something with the complexity of a Band-Aid or something with the complexity of an MRI machine, the process we follow is exactly the same every time. And so because we're following the same process, we can use the same tools. And so I do happen to use SysML and these MBSE methodologies every time I develop a project because, again, it's helping us think in a different way about our system. So there's really no 
reason not to use it. So uh, something that, you know, on the scale of, of a, a bandage is going to take a few minutes to build that model. Something that the uh, scope and scale of an MRI machine could potentially take a, a few weeks to build the model. So I don't see any reason not to use it as long as you're using it smartly. And that said, there are a lot of efficiencies that we gain by doing that, especially as we, for example, we all have to abide by certain safety standards. Well, I can create a library of requirements from the safety standard. And now when I develop my new system, I bring the library into my model, I trace those requirements to the pieces of my system where they're applicable, and I have my trace matrix built automatically. I don't have to sit and, and kind of grunt through an Excel spreadsheet to try to figure out what traces. I've done it all in the model. I've done it all in the context of the system. And so for me, there's no reason not to use these methodologies and these tools, regardless of project size and scale. So a great Perfect. question. Um, that's awesome. And I think that that's all the time that we have for questions. Thanks again so much, Casey, for sharing your time and expertise today. Uh, it's clear that the audience found this information very useful and interesting. Thanks again, everybody, for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event.